Okay, so we are recording. Um, hello, everyone. My name is David Lieberman. I'm Sachin Parikh. Um, and um, we are the two facial plastic surgeons of LMP Aesthetics. And um, uh, just so you know, we ha have been working in concert together doing some surgery. So we are kind of uh, uh, maintaining appropriate social distancing, um, but we're also sort of in the same um, um, sort of health bubble right now. Um, and uh, we are lucky enough today to be joined by video conferencing by our amazing uh, patient who will introduce herself in a second. Um, and the point of today's video is really to try and do a deep dive into the facial rejuvenation process, both from the patient's perspective, but then also from our perspective. So we're really lucky to be joined here by Jenny. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm Jenny Hacker. Um, so, um, Jenny, do you want to just do a, just a quick, uh, you know, who you are and, and uh, why you're here, then we're going to kind of dive into the sequence of question asking and looking at some photos. Well, I'm here to explain what my experience was like uh, pre and post-op with uh, having had surgery with Drs. Lieberman and Parikh. And it turned out to be a rather unique and fabulous experience. Um, okay, great. So uh, we'll dive right in and we're going to kind of go back and forth between patient's perspective and doctor's perspective and hopefully um, we'll kind of paint a, a really comprehensive and fun picture here. So um, why did you decide to have this procedure? I grew tired of looking at myself in my magnifying mirror, which I know you're never supposed to do, but I do. And I, I grew tired of just the sagging jowls and my lined face. And I also had a 20 pound weight loss. So things became quite exaggerated and droopy. Okay, great. Um, and what were your thoughts leading up to the consultation in terms of, um, you know, why did you make a consultation? Um, and uh, uh, how did you uh, start looking for I interviewed uh, a grand total, including you two, of six plastic surgeons over a period of a few years. And I could never quite find, I never felt like I had the right connection with someone. And since I go a lot on my gut instinct, I, that was important to me. So after the fifth one, I had a intuitive thought, which was faces only. And so as soon as I, got back to my home office, I opened up my computer and I Googled plastic surgeons faces only and LNP aesthetics came up and I immediately picked up the phone and called and made an appointment for a consultation. So I think that's great, Jenny. I mean, um, you, are, uh, you are an advocate for yourself and you had um, you know, six consults and every individual is gonna have a different number for them. And Dave and I sometimes try to advise patients if they want to get second opinions and consults, they totally should. Uh, you know, everything has a magic number in, in life sometimes. And I think, you know, some people can get overwhelmed. Um, you didn't, but I think three is a good number for a lot of patients. Um, yes. They start to hear different solutions and it can often confuse them. But if you feel like you're getting the information and you need to do more than three, then I think people can do it right for them. But um, kudos to you for, for kind of putting that all together and then advocating for yourself. When you decided to go with us, what made you decide? Like what set us apart? It started with the initial phone call. I spoke with Yolanda and she was calm. She spent plenty of time with me answering my questions. And I set up an appointment right away. And then I had, I think I waited like a week or two to, to get in. And when I came in the office, again, the same sense of calm and people that care. And after I met, and when Dave came in the exam room to interview me or to talk with me, I also had brought my husband with me, by the way, because he's a retired veterinary ophthalmologist who's done thousands of eye surgeries on animals. So I dragged him along, it wasn't hard, I didn't have to drag him at all, I brought him along. And I wanted him to hear and see. And I just felt the minute Dave walked in the room, it was like that connection, I felt it. He was sincere, 
he was gentle. Uh, he asked me questions. He clearly took a long look at my face. And ultimately, we ended up looking at before and after photos. But here's what's interesting. As we walked out of the exam room that day to go back to the other office to look at photos, my husband leaned into my ear and he said, this guy knows what he's doing. So <laughs> we, both, we both had that sense at the same time. Well, it's, it's uh, very sweet of you to say. You know, I, I, um, for me, um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I speak for Sachin, um, the consult is obviously, it's an important experience. It's an important time to educate patients about the way we see things. And, yes. you know, you, you want to be able to, obviously in doing what we're doing, we spend a lot of time analyzing face, faces. We think about why aging changes have occurred. And that helps us think about what's going to look the best in terms of doing right. facial rejuvenation surgery. But I don't, I think the best way to empower a patient to make a decision is if you can educate them you know, uh, about the way we're thinking and how we're seeing things. Yes. Patients tend to walk away from that saying, I have more of an idea of, of what I'm getting myself into, you know, a, a, a less fear about something going awry during surgery. Because um, I, I really do think education is, is, um, is really paramount. So uh, one question that came in from Instagram, because we, you know, we uh, um, did a little uh, teaser about this and we got a lot of questions. So we've chosen a couple of questions from Instagram. Um, uh, and was, how old were you in the before picture that we're about to show? <laughs> Let's see. Um, I was 71. Okay. Okay. So, um, Sasha and I thought we would go from uh, hairline uh, to neck and just kind of do a little bit of a analysis of what we see when we look at a face preoperatively. Um, and uh, look a little bit at the aging changes and then um, uh, how we think about suggesting procedures. So I'm going to take uh, kind of what we call the upper third. So that's basically, you know, everything up, um, above this blue line. So um, we typically say there, there are a number of things that are contributing to the aging changes in this area. The two primary ones are the position of the brow and forehead complex, and then the eyelid itself. So you can see, obviously, that if a brow is heavy, is sitting lower, it will influence how much soft tissue is hooding over or crowding the upper eyelid complex. You can especially see this to be true on the three quarters view, where the majority of what you're looking at here that's positioned lower than it should be is the brow complex, not the eyelids themselves. Um, and by elevating that brow complex, and some, you know, this is a lateral brow out here, this is more the medial brow, this is the temple area, but by elevating this, you're revealing more of the eye itself and the upper eyelid complex. Now, so in this case, obviously, the brow position and heaviness is contributing um, to the, the appearance of, the, of, of aging changes, um, but then what we also look for is when you elevate the brow, how much eyelid skin is redundant as well. So excess eyelid skin or dermatochalasis is a component of, of rejuvenation in this area and removing that eyelid skin. We will also address any excess fat that's um, uh, prominent or, or showing or bulging in this area close to the nose. And this is a good area to, to reduce volume but we, uh, Sasha and I, are also very careful to minimize volume loss um, in the central orbital complex. Um, uh, preserving some volume there is important, and uh, we minimize our treatment of the fat in that area. Uh, I, I do want to point out that um, uh, the idea of facial asymmetry. So, you know, I always tell people I've never met a, a symmetric face. I, I'm sure Dr. Freak has also never met a symmetric face. We are all uniquely asymmetric. And it's important to, to notice these things preoperatively, both as a surgeon, but also to discuss them with patients. Um, and just kind of look at the two sides. Is the bone structure different? Does one eye sit a little bit higher than the other? Is the, is the presentation of the upper eyelid a little different from side to side? The brow complex uh, lower on one side versus another. These are <clears throat> asymmetries that can be improved. Uh, but never completely fixed, and they shouldn't be 
the goal shouldn't be to completely eliminate asymmetry because I think each of our own unique asymmetry is what makes us look like us. It's what makes us uniquely uh, beautiful. And um, uh, some asymmetries can be reduced, but uh, again, the, the goal is to enhance someone's natural presentation, not to change the way that they were made. Uh, I'll take it. Um, I'm going to kind of focus on the mid face here and the lower eyelid and to cheek complex. Um, and uh, I'm going to dissect your face a little bit more, Jenny. Um, and you know, one of the things that I notice um, when looking at her is uh, what you're seeing here, which is the bulging of the lower eyelid fat bags. Now, we have three fat bags in the lower eyelid uh, area. One is close to the nose. There's a central one that's in the middle here. And then another one, which is the lateral fat bag, which is out by, at the corner of the eye. As we age, what happens is that these fat bags start to kind of push forward. And there's a little wall, and you can see that on this oblique views. There's a little wall called a septum, an orbital septum. It's kind of a soft wall, almost a curtain. And um, it becomes looser or doesn't hold the fat back as well as we age. And you start to see this bulge of the lower eyelid. What it does is that it creates a separation in the mind's eye between the lower eyelid, which goes from kind of this lid margin to the end of the lower eyelid, and now the cheek. So you're seeing kind of two separate and distinct structures. What makes a face more youthful, and we'll see these on um, Jenny's beautiful post-operative uh, post pictures, is that you want this to kind of blend into one contiguous smooth structure. Now, uh, Jenny's fat we addressed in surgery by actually going on the inside of her eye and taking out the fat. Uh, Dr. Lieber and I like to customize that procedure based on the patient and their anatomy and where their eyeball sits in relation to their orbital bone or how, how strong their lower lid is. Um, and sometimes we'll actually, instead of removing this fat, we'll move this fat into this area. And we select that patient based on you know, some of those factors. Another thing that I noticed with Jenny is that you know, she's starting to get this kind of crease from the cheek to the nose. And you see this kind of crescenteric, it's very um, minor, but you see this kind of crescenteric area right here where she's holding on to a little bit of fluid. That's called malar edema. Malar is apple in Latin, and edema means swelling. And it's not like a water balloon where you can put a needle in and suck that fluid out. It's more like a wet sponge. Um, it, her cheeks have deflated, and all her mid faces have kind of deflate or lose volume over time. The mid face is made up of, of, of a whole host of, of, of layers. The deepest or the hardest layer is the bone, and then you've got fat on top of that, and then you've got muscular layers and then skin layers. And we, we, we see a, vol a loss of volume in all three layers. One of the nice, unique things that we did with Jenny, and we, we do this a lot in our aging face uh, um, uh, rejuvenations, is we want to bring volume back into the mid face. And we accomplish this in two ways. One is we um, address it by putting in fat, and the other way we do it is by kind of lifting this mid face fat pad up and kind of in this 60-ish uh, degree vector. So I think one of, the, one of the things I noticed here is that we just wanted to create a nice kind of contiguous complex um, with Jenny's uh, lower eyelid to cheek complex. And the last thing, you'll notice kind of the textural changes of Jenny's um, lower lid uh, skin. That skin is some of the thinnest skin in the body and it's kind of crepey. And um, we are gonna address that in, in, in her surgery and kind of when we go over the surgical plan, how we took care of that kind of textural changes uh, to her skin, not only in this area, but in the upper face, around the mouth, and kind of in the entire face and in the neck. Okay. David, I want to kind yeah. of tackle gravity so, and volume. So, Jenny, are you, are, you, are you tolerating this okay? <laughs> <laughs> I am. A it's bit, it's, so, it's okay. kind of hard to look at, but. <laughs> okay, yeah. no, you're, you're being a good sport. I, it's, uh, but okay. I don't mind. It's, it's also rather inter I, it's interesting. Okay, all right. So, um, so let's talk about kind of the lower face and neck gravity changes. There's so much semantics about what lower face and neck means. Um, we do um, the, the face lift or face and neck lift that we do is based on a, a deep plane face and neck lift traditionally described and there have been modifications over time. Um, and uh, there are, you know, obviously certain centers um, that do this across the country. Um, uh, this is not the standard lift that people do, um, and we, uh, you know, follow along from what we've learned from our, our mentors and have kind of uh, uh, 
uh, continue to adapt it in our own hands. Um, but the idea behind a really high level face and neck lift is a surgery that not only addresses jawline and neck, but is also going to be tackling this piece of soft tissue here, which is called the mid face or mid face back pain. What I like to describe to people is that the gravity change that happens is that the soft tissue of the face descends in this down and forward direction, okay? And what you can see is it collects kind of in this zone. So on both sides, where that groove that he was talking about, in front of it is the collection of that soft tissue which has fallen in this direction, okay? And you can imagine a face and neck lift that addresses, you know, below this line is tackling the majority of concerns for some people, but really this entire complex has fallen with these gravity changes. And a, a deep plane lift, what it will do is it releases this soft tissue that has fallen. And once it's released appropriately, it is then straightforward to resuspend it back where it came from, okay? So the other thing that's important to point out, and I love to point this out during consultations, is the soft tissue gravity changes have a big vertical descent. There's a vertical component to the way things fall. And if you have a lift that moves things in this direction back only, that is not a natural resuspending of that soft tissue. You've moved it in a different direction than where it fell. So if you do a comprehensive release of this stuff, you are then able to resuspend that soft tissue in the direction it came from and therefore achieve a more natural outcome, okay? It's a sort of a straightforward concept, but I think it gets lost a lot and it, it helps to explain why some outcomes tend to look a little bit unnatural. Even if jawline is sharp and neckline is good, there's something not quite appropriate about the result versus results that look really natural, that it's very hard to tell if something was done, that the, the suspension of the soft tissue looks kind of effortless. Um, and then, ooh, what have I done? Hold on, I gotta get it back up. Hang on, Jenny. Okay. Um, so, and then people say, is that a lower face and neck lift? I mean, that comes up a lot. Yes, in many ways, it is a lower face and neck lift because we are not addressing this kind of lower lid and upper third complex. But while we're addressing the lower face and neck, we are capturing really what has fallen in this lower face and neck. And I think that it, it just, it makes a big difference in creating that seamless rejuvenation. Okay. Um, I also want to point out the soft tissue that we're talking about that's falling here anatomically it's the same tissue layer i'm talking about the stuff below the skin as these nasty little bands that we all get okay mm -hmm. those bands are muscle bands and it's the superficial muscle in the neck and if the skin goes away this muscle is continuous with the soft tissue that has fallen in the lower face and the mid face mm -hmm. and so it stands to reason that as you're rejuvenating that neck muscle laxity that you should be rejuvenating the rest of that anatomical layer, which is living here. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then I'm gonna go ahead and kind of discuss the, the lip and the skin, and then we'll kind of wrap this, this part up and kind of pitch it back over to Jenny. Um, this is often overlooked, and not every patient that kind of comes in for consultation notices um, this portion of their face. But as we age, we see a difference kind of in this area around the mouth. Uh, medically, it's called the perioral area. Um, but what happens is uh, we have a lot of loss of volume in the maxilla, which is the bone that kind of houses the mid-face. Uh, we see a, a lengthening of this upper lip. Now, a lot of us think of the, the upper lip or the lip being defined by this red lip. But act in, in, in medical terms, when we're looking at a face, the upper lip is that whole subunit that goes from the bottom of the columella, which is that structure at the bottom of the nose, all the way to the bottom of the red lip, which is here. And in Jenny, this had started to lengthen, and it kind of 
creates a, a disharmony in terms of the proportions of the face. And if we can shorten this distance, it makes the whole face just look more heart-shaped and, and a little bit more youthful by making this dist by making this distance short. And also kind of creates just a, a, a prettier mouth. It doesn't address these lines in the lip. Um, and the procedure I'm getting at is a, a lip lift, is, is one of the things that we did. It's an incision that's kind of hidden under the nose. And um, by shortening that, it creates kind of this harmony of the whole face. The lines are different. And those lines that kind of in her whole face, uh, they're textural changes predominantly from sun damage. And, you know, there are two kind of major ways to address fine lines and texture when we're rejuvenating the face. One is with a chemical peel, um, and another one is with a laser. Um, deep resurfacing laser, uh, Dave and I have really gotten some wonderful results with. Um, we used a, a nice laser to kind of etch out all these lines. It's essentially, in a controlled fashion, taking off layers of skin and then allowing kind of newer skin to come forward and, and, and um, form collagen. And that's what it addresses, not only the texture that you're seeing in her upper lip, but also the texture around her eyes and her forehead, and some of the texture that you'll even see improved um, around the mouth area and into the neck. And then the last two comments, just in terms of the lip lift, you know, as well as the shortening of, the, of this portion of the lip does have, uh, if done well, can look really natural and youthful. And you will see a little bit more of that red lip, which tends to thin out over time. So people that are looking for a little bit more presentation of the red lip without necessarily making it bigger, this is a really um, kind of elegant and attractive option. And the last thing to pick on, Jenny, is um, uh, just looking at the chin position and whether or not there's any value in creating a little subtle feminine augmentation of the chin region. And when done right, it can be a, 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 a really uh, beautiful addition. So so that's it. So let, let's, um, let's go back to... Okay, so day of surgery. We've kind of talked about the plan. We set up, and we we've uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about questions, just making sure that you feel comfortable. Um, describe what it felt like on the day of surgery, and leading up to it. Uh, leading up to, I had I waited two months before um, I had the surgery, and in that two month period, I did a lot of thinking, and I had a few sleepless nights. But it wasn't that I was concerned about actually the procedure that I was going to have. It was my concern was about the anesthesia because I was going to be anesthetized for as long as eight hours. And that seemed to me like a long time. So fortunately, I was um, Dr. Spears, um, LMP's anesthesiologist, called me. We talked three times. And he reassured me that he would be moving body parts around and I would not be just laying in a static position for eight hours. So I was much relieved after I talked to him. And I also was dealing with another issue and that was what am I gonna tell people because if I go through, which I was gonna go through with all this work that I was gonna do, I was gonna look remarkably different. And I decided after listening to other people who've had facelifts and pretending that they didn't, and that uh, I went on vacation or I got a new haircut or I did whatever, I decided that I would just be frank. And so I'm honest. So when people who haven't seen me for a while take a look at me and they're like, whoa, what happened? I tell them. I just say, you know, I had some plastic surgery. I have no shame about it. I am feel totally blessed and thrilled that I went through with it. The morning of surgery, I woke up and I was I had no no jitters at all, no jittery stomach, nothing. I was just prepared and ready to go into surgery and get it behind me. So for anyone considering doing uh, plastic surgery, you're gonna, you'll have some doubts along the way. But I, I had confidence. I knew that my surgeons were, were polished and excellent and they were artists because I've, I've decided that it's not only just having the technical skill of doing fine surgery, but I think that plastic surgeons have to have 
an artistic eye. And I got two guys that had artistic eyes. So anyway, I went for it. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, uh, sort of embarrassing to listen to, but it's, it's great. Thank you. <laughs> Don't be. No, I mean, it, so, so let's, let's, um, so let's go back, right? Um, let's go with just a surgical plan. Yeah. And then let's, we can, um, I wanted to bring up some of the, of this one, right? Okay. This is kind of early with it. Let's see. Yeah, but uh, we're gonna have to do that again. Oh, yeah, she does. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, actually, let's do. This is the year. Okay. Sorry. Almost figured out, Jenny. That's okay. So, Jenny, can you see you now? Uh, yeah. And then you can see the little pen. I, uh, I see the pen, but I don't see yeah. any. Yes, and it's. I see it drawing. Okay, okay. great. Okay, so um, this is before and a year out ish. Okay. Um, the, the current day, we're a little bit more than a year and a half out, um, and uh, we'll kind of get to that, but. Uh, uh, we just thought it would be sort of useful just to kind of talk about the order that we do things and, you know, a couple little pearls from each component of the procedure. Again, going top to bottom. Um, uh, do you want to switch it up? Yeah, sure. So um, in terms of uh, the order that we do things, um, for the most part, like any surgery, you know, Dave and I have a system. The system uh, doesn't deviate much. Um, in terms of the order, how things go. And uh, we usually try to start top to bottom um, with a couple of things. So the overall surgical plan, um, Jenny had a brow lift. It's, it was an endoscopic brow lift. So all the incisions were hidden in her hairline for the brow lift. There's an incision kind of here and then two tiny incisions here. Um, and uh, in order to elevate the brow, we use sutures to elevate the brow kind of laterally. And then we use a little thing called an endotine, which is a guitar pick that's dissolvable. It's almost the thickness of a very thin uh, wafer. And it has these tiny little spikes in it and it gets affixed to the underlying tissue and it allows the tissue to kind of be suspended higher and stay in place and it dissolves in a couple of months. The other part of the uh, kind of Jenny's prescribed plan was an upper eyelid surgery. We also did a lower eyelid surgery. We did a fat transfer, so we had harvested fat from her belly, a facelift, a neck lift, a lip lift, laser resurfacing, and a, and a chin implant. Um, so Jenny really, you know, kind of went for it, and um, I'll kind of speak to the, this upper face. So you can see how her eyes are just more open. Um, one of the questions that came in on Instagram is, you know, were her eyes opened up from eyelid surgery or from the facelift? And it obviously the whole thing. Um, the face lift helps, but the eyelid surgery, the upper eyelid surgery in the brow and the lower eyelid surgery really kind of rejuvenate the eye complex. Um, you can see how some of that asymmetry that Jenny has preoperatively still exists postoperatively. And like Dr. Lieberman mentioned, we, can, we, we go into it trying to make people as symmetric as possible, but no one is perfectly symmetric before and we can't promise perfect symmetry afterwards. And that's kind of what makes us uniquely us. Um, releasing all these ligaments in this area is important to get that brow to elevate. And then, you know, um, taking a, a conservative amount of skin from the upper eyelid while kind of contouring very conservatively the upper eyelid fat bags is what's creating kind of that nice opening of the upper eyelid brow complex. Um. Okay, so for lower lids, and you know, for Jenny, I think just to bring it back, we, we want to always, you know, you want to look back at what we drew, drew beforehand and show that just that 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 fullness, that that drop of that lateral brow complex has now been uh, released and lifted, just showing you know uh, more of that upper eyelid complex. So for the lower eyelids, as Dr. Freak mentioned, is can you make a transition between the lash line and the cheek as youthful and seamless as possible? Um, and 
it's we talk so much about gravity volume texture gravity volume texture and each component of a face ages because of gravity volume texture so if you look back at the before you've got gravity issues where um, the the mid face has come down there's a little bit of revealing of that malar edema you've got this groove here you've got the hollowing here volume loss a little bit of gravity changes with the fat around the, of the lower lid coming out so again, some gravity changes, some volume loss, and then you've got the texture on top. And by, by doing that kind of conservative periorbital or around the eye fat transfer, we're able to add a little volume in appropriate areas of the anterior cheek and the, and the uh, zygomat or the uh, cheekbones here, um, remove the fat that's kind of pooching out here, remove a little skin, and then resurface with a laser or a chemical peel with the idea, again, of creating that soft transition between lash line and cheek. One of the fun things to look at is the longer a lower eyelid presents, okay, the, 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 more, the older it looks. So if we say this is kind of what the lower eyelid looks like in the before photo, you could maybe say that the lower eyelid looks here in the after. Mm. Shortening makes a big difference in how youthful a, a lower eyelid can present. In a lot of ways, lower eyelids are sort of the um, uh, holy grail of rejuvenation. Um, and I'll just bring up a, can you see that, Jenny? Yeah. Yes. Uh, We're all on the same screen. Uh, yeah, sorry. So I'll just do this without drawing, okay? Okay. Um, but again, this idea of, um, you know, uh, lower eyelid um, rejuvenation, just to show different, different views, okay? And then you want to go to the lift? You can go back to whatever. Oh, yeah. So um, this is a good one. So I'll, I'll speak to the lift. Um, and we spent some time talking about this when we're analyzing um, Jenny's preoperative photograph. But <clears throat> there are kind of the key with the lift is making sure that those deeper tissues are released and then resuspended in a natural vector. The, the deeper tissues that we're mentioning are the one kind of in the mid face and cheek area. The deeper tissues and these kind of ligaments that are in the jowl area. And the jowl area is that kind of collection of tissue that you see at the jawline and kind of uh, just under the corner of the mouth. And then the release and resuspension of tissue in the neck. And you can see kind of a wonderful kind of difference in this kind of accordion-like skin beforehand and then everything's kind of rejuvenated um, and uh, you see a distinct uh, border between her jawline and her neck. So there's this separation mm -hmm. and it's not just one contiguous structure. Um, the incisions for a facelift, we get that question all the time. They're, they're hidden. Um, there's a portion of the incision that's hidden in the front of the hairline kind of by uh, Jenny's uh, temporal tuft. Uh, there's a portion that's hidden behind the tragus, which is that little piece of cartilage in front of your ear canal. And then uh, the incision kind of carries on the back of the ear and down the hairline in the back. So ultimately, uh, we want Jenny, and Jenny has very, she wears her hair very short, as you guys can see. Um, uh, we want at a conversational distance that incision to be difficult for someone to see. Um, and that's, you know, that's our goal with every um, person who has a facelift surgery. Um, you want to tackle the mouth? Sure. So uh, this is a great, so with subnasal lip lifting, you know, you can be aggressive, you can be conservative. Ultimately, you want it to be as natural as possible. So this shortening of, the, of her upper lip, so she has a, um, careful I'm doing this, but uh, she has a, a, an incision underneath the nose here that has uh, continued to fade and fade so that people, it's not something that's noticeable when, when you're looking at Jenny. But by shortening this distance, again, this is, uh, I don't remember if it maybe six millimeters shorter. Um, we've created that shorter look. It has less of that kind of elongated um, look of the upper lip, curled that red lip out a little bit, just so it shows it, it has a little bit of a perkier, more youthful. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, it makes a big difference. That combined with creating this sort of um, conservative, feminine strengthening of the chin area and some resurfacing around the mouth. And, and you know, what we do, thinking about making adjustments in multiple different components of facial aging in each one of these areas, not overdoing any one of them, is really important to kind of maintain that emphasis on 
unnatural outcome so that when someone presents to you, they, they look as natural uh, and appropriate as possible. There was one question that came in about um, fat transfer. So we do fat transfer on um, uh, some, not all, facial rejuvenation cases. We often kind of encourage people that have had significant volume loss to consider doing it because it does really add a nice, soft, youthful component. There are MRI volume studies that we uh, think about, our own experience that we think about. In general, about 50 to 60% of fat that you place will go away over the course of a year. And uh, fat is a living cell. You remove it from its happy blood supply and you place it somewhere else. The cells that get a blood supply will survive. The ones that don't will be metabolized and go away. Despite the fact that it's not 100% foolproof, we know that there are some really excellent long-term benefits of doing a fat transfer, but it is not a, co a permanent, complete, comprehensive uh, volume replacement or cure. Uh, and I think that's part of the preoperative discussion. One other thing to add is just where do we get fat from? And it, um, there are kind of a couple of places that we feel like are the highest yield areas. Uh, we usually will go either to the abdomen or to the uh, kind of outer thigh area as our kind of go-to areas. And on some of our patients that we need to get more fat or they're, they're thin, sometimes we'll go to the inner thigh area or the flanks. Um, so um, kind of touching all those areas sometimes or harvesting fat from all those areas is necessary. And I'd say a majority of the time, the abdomen and the outer thighs gives us enough. In terms of how much fat, to put it in perspective, it's not a lot. It's, you know, um, we will harvest about, you know, 10 to 12 teaspoons, and we will actually process that fat, purify that fat. We wash it using a really um, uh, elegant system called PureGraft, and then we'll inject it back into the patient's face, and um, we'll inject back anywhere from five to seven teaspoons on um, larger rejuvenation cases, and sometimes three or four teaspoons when it's a limited fat transfer and a patient has held on to a lot of volume in the aging process and hasn't deflated as much. So we're not talking a lot about a lot of volume being put back in. And then in the grand scheme of things, you're going to lose anywhere from 40 to 50% of that volume within, a first, within the first year. So it's not, people don't have to fear that they're going to be over volumized long term. Okay, so just to wrap it up. So again, before, here's Jenny kind of today, this was taken just a, a little bit ago, you know, the and I just think, you know, we can talk a little bit about her experience and her life afterwards, but, you know, we just love, I mean, seeing Jenny and- We're going to get into the uh, post-op process here with Jenny and her yeah. and her input, but do we have any pictures of her um, in her healing phase? Because those will be good to, to see, and then Jenny's going to speak to kind of what it was like while she was healing. Jenny, can we show a couple more photos? Sure. So just so people can see- Oh, yeah. You know, this is kind of uh, what we'll often do beforehand in terms of parking, right? Is that we, in the upright position, we're placing some marks on people. It's sort of a, a funny process. A lot of people take selfies while we're doing it. Um, uh, so this is pretty fresh, actually. Yeah, there's, there's those two in there. They're a month apart, this one and this one. So this is pretty soon after. Yeah. So here's, um, Jenny, tell us if you can see these two. So um, yes, I see them. Uh, a couple weeks after the surgery where she's kind of in that present, you know, without makeup in that presentable phase, still holding on to some bruising. Um, and then this must be, I think this is, yeah, and this is, I think actually, Jenny, did you have a facial in this photo? Uh, after the surgery? Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, I did, but it was a while. I mean, it was like, six, seven, eight weeks later or something, I think. Um, but I think if we look at this photograph, you know, given how, um, given what we did, it's important to kind of see what that first several weeks can look like, you know, and this is after the really acute swelling um, so that you're almost cover upable in terms of all bruising. And, you know, I think in terms of time frame for healing, what I try to tell people is that in general, you are presentable two to three weeks after surgery. Presentable does not mean you're done healing. And some people are on the outer edge of that range, especially if we're doing multiple combined procedures. 
And then in general, you're going to look your absolute best starting about two to three months after surgery. And there's a, a, a difference. And we'll ask Jenny to kind of speak to that. Um, so, yeah, stop sharing. Just let Jenny. So, Jenny, um, we have a couple of questions that came in about the postoperative process. Um, you know, I, I, first thing I want to ask you is, you know, we'll get into a little bit of detail here, but what are some of the highlights of your recovery? You know, and I'm sure you're going to share some pearls for our audience, but what do you remember? Um, you know, people always ask about pain level and when you felt like you could exercise, when you felt like you could go out again with some camouflage makeup on and present yourself to the public. Um, when did you feel normal again? I, we'd love for you to speak to a little bit of that. Okay. Well, the first night, uh, was pretty rough. I had a very large thick wrap around my head. I had drains hanging down and my head felt like I was wearing a basketball. And it was a restless night. I didn't sleep well. Um, I, I kind of ached all over, uh, but I'm a super sensitive kind of gal. So I, my reaction might've been different than some other people. After uh, the first week was, I would say, the, the most rugged. But the thing that really surprised me is that I, I had very little pain. I only took one hydrocodone the entire time and the rest of the time I, I took Tylenol. So I had expected I would have more pain, but I, I really didn't. I've had abdominal surgery and let me tell you, having a facelift was a walk in the park compared to that. I also, when I, as, as time went on and uh, I was healing, swelling started to go down. My eyes itched like crazy. I just wanted to just dig away at them, but I refused to touch my eyes. So I didn't, but I'm just saying there was a lot of, of irritation around my eye. I also would get what I called zingers where I would just get this little sharp pain, a little sharp, just, um, just a millisecond of a pain, and then it would go away. And I also was not, I was very conscious of the scars, but the truth is they were disappearing so fast that both my husband and I were stunned at how quickly and easily the scars were just blending in and it was looking like very little happened except for redness. So. I had some redness in my skin. I'm sure that's partly from the lasering. And I also ran into a little bit of trouble with the sutures under my nose after the uh, lip lift. I had a reaction to the suture material. So I had some kind of red bumps that became tender, but I came back in to see the doctors and they pressed and did whatever they did and they, they went away and eventually they were all gone that my friend became during this recovery, one, I rented a large, supposedly medical recliner for whatever that means, sat it in the middle of my living room in front of the big screen TV. And that's where I lived literally for five weeks. I did not sleep in a bed. I slept in a recliner and I was very comfortable. And my second friend is this little guy and this is, one of those old style ice bags. And I used ice, not, you don't want to put ice on the areas where you had fat injection. So I avoided those. But what would happen is sometimes my face would just feel really tight and just kind of achy. And I just feel this was, and I just hold it just in different places around my head. And it was so soothing. Highly recommend. Other than that, about week three, um, I was doing walking around our backyard and in week three, I actually went out on the trail and did some walking. And I did it at night. So I didn't, I didn't want to draw too much attention to myself, but it felt fabulous to be out. And the other thing that was really interesting during this process of recovery is my husband's reaction. As the swelling went down, I was sitting across the dinner table and he, I would catch him looking at me and also just doing some other, some other activity we were involved in. He would just be looking at me and he would just smile and say, 
you look amazing. He's, I cannot believe this. You look amazing. You are beautiful. And of course, that was exactly what I needed to hear at that point. So my results, I thought, were rapid. And um, within, at the beginning of the sixth week, I went out totally into the public wearing a rather heavier kind of a makeup, um, mostly still, again, just to cover the redness. I, the scarring was very minimal. And uh, other than that, let's see, I, I, um, so, yeah, well, <laughs> I just. So this is, a, this is amazing. I think this is an amazing insight. Um, a couple of things that I just want to point out um, about what you said. So the sutures under the lip, actually, since we've uh, done your case, we've, we've changed the suture material and, and um, uh, we have seen significantly less of those little uh, kind of suture pimples. Red bumps, yeah. Not to be long-term bothersome, but they're annoying when they happen and we've, we've seen a significant drop in those. You know, not everyone is gonna sit, is gonna have the recliner. Um, I think we really did go above and beyond in terms of the recovery. and. You know, I, I, it's amazing. There is with anything we do, the more you put into something, you know, sometimes the more you get out. Of it. But it, it is you can get away with being with extra pillows in the bed. Um, Absolutely. But there are obviously some things that that really did make life easier for you, and we really appreciate you um, sharing those. Um, I would say just a comment. You know, the laser does tend to extend that short-term recovery because of the redness, as you mentioned. In really do have to pay attention to camouflaging with makeup in those first several weeks because the laser is a doozy. That being said, nothing can achieve what it achieves in terms of resurfacing. So it's a little bit of a, um, you know, a, a plus minus for that. Um, do you have any, uh, um, you, you've done a wonderful job um, with maintenance, Jenny, mm -hmm. and um, looking even better and better as months have passed. Yeah, I know. Um, Thank you. And, and uh, you know, I hope you do share some of the stories about what's happened since, but any tips with, when it comes to, did you find a makeup line that you really loved for camouflaging? I know you had some thoughts about skincare. Um, yeah. And, you know, I know some of our audience wanted to know, like, when did you get your hair color? Um, you know, and just some th things like that that you can maybe speak to. Oh, uh, hair, hair coloring. Oh gosh, that was probably couple months after I had the surgery. But we ask, we ask our patients to wait about five weeks to get their hair. Yeah, I, I think I waited. Colored right before surgery. And then yes. And let me say, I wrote down everything. Ah, uh, I used um, Oxygenics, Oxygenics, which Oxygenics. is a product that you all sell yep. for that face makeup. The trick I learned with that is I always wear sunscreen um, every day of my life. However, especially was useful underneath that oxygenics. It, that is kind of a dry um, texture to it, and it helped to smooth it. So I, I used that for probably, oh, I bet I used that five or six months before I switched over to uh, just a regular uh, uh, foundation. And then I continued with, um, I, the thing about the, the post-op of the laser, you don't want to put anything on your face, um, any cosmetics on your face for a while. It's just totally inappropriate. You won't want to put anything on your face for a while. I just used a simple um, uh, moisture, kind of a neutral moisturizer. Yeah. Uh, and then eventually I went back into, I started using SkinCeuticals, uh, which is a product that I bought here. And uh, I cleansed uh, twice a day. And in the morning, just warm washcloth, just water. And in the evening, I would do a much more in-depth cleansing. But following each cleansing, I would put on, in the morning, I put on the SkinCeuticals uh, 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 better uh, skin, better science is what I was using serum, and then I followed that with a very uh, just simple moisturizer, and I also put on eye cream, and then in the evening is when I did my really super deep cleaning, which was, and I found Burt's Bees cleansing oil, 
and a warm washcloth worked very well. And then my cellular cleansing water to make sure I got all the oil off and also any kind of residual makeup. And then I have this thing I do where I splash ice cold water on my face in, after I have, it's kind of a little red, you know, cause I've been working on it. I splash ice cold water on my face and I, count, I actually count it. You all, you're probably getting the idea I'm rather meticulous. And I count, I do like 12 to 15 splashes on my face. Then I just pat dry. And then I follow with um, the Skin uh, Better Rejuvenating Cream and eye cream and then a, a moisturizer for sensitive skin. So, um... Thank you for sharing that. You know, and, and some of the some of the uh, some of, some stuff has even evolved since your surgery. I know we have kind of a more in depth camouflage guide for our patients okay. now, <laughs> cool so stuff. there's more options other than oxygenetics. And then I, I think it was great because you know you kind of went through um, a, a, a regimen that's very uh, very detailed, mm -hmm. um, and we try to create regimens that are simple or detailed based on patient preference. And then we also, uh, I loved how you kind of brought in some of the outside stuff, you know, some of the products you can get in our office, but some of the stuff like Burt's Bees, you know, that worked well for you. And I think it's important for patients to figure out afterwards, like what's the best way to maintain their skin? What regimen can they be compliant with? And can they mix and match uh, things that work really well for their maintenance afterwards? So I think it. I think most people probably wouldn't go to the extent that I go to at times, <laughs> but like, I'm, I am um, quite uh, perfectionistic about things, especially my skin. I'm really conscious of my skin. There's one thing I wanted to mention that really turned out to be significant, and that was sleeping. I sleep 90% of the time on my back, but sometimes I just get sick and tired of laying on my back, so I want to lay on my side. So I had to figure out a way that I could lie on my side and on my face that I didn't recreate all the mess I had just gotten rid of. So I had a, one of those travel neck pillows that a lot of people have. And normally you put it around like this and those little arm like things come down. Well, I figured out if I laid it sideways like this and those little ends came out this way and underneath I would support my chin and the top of my head, my face was free in the middle and it wasn't being smashed. So. <laughs> That's just something that I have found extremely successful and simple. This is, it's so great. It, it's, I would tell you, uh, um, you know, one of the things that we try to do in this practice in general is um, we, Sasha and I don't think it's, it's just us by any means. I think the team that we have worked hard to build over the years tries to support people throughout this entire journey. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is gonna be as self-motivated as Jenny is, and the idea is that we want to be able to provide you with these reference points, you know, uh, resources, uh, guidance, whether it be through our nursing services, esthetician services, front desk services, concierge services. And, you know, because I, I think it's uh, the more people feel supported, the easier this process can be. Um, and, uh, but, I, you know, obviously at the end of the day, it's up to a patient to kind of, uh, figure out what's going to work best for them. Absolutely. It's a very individual thing. Um, so a couple of uh, wrap-up questions, okay? okay. Or um, uh, bird's eye view, okay? One question, you know, that I think is more philosophical about cosmetic surgery, plastic surgery, the stigmas associated with it, is does, did this process feel superficial to you? Uh, was, it, was it meaningful beyond treating a couple wrinkles? Absolutely. I, I feel like the outside of me now looks like the inside of me, which I have been cultivating and through meditation and prayer and just kind of taking a long look at myself and my life. And all of those wrinkles and lines were more the person I was for 60, 70 years. And not that one changes or can change that dramatically in a short period of time, but there is definitely an evolution that's taking place within me. And so finally, I feel like my outside is connecting more with my inside. I'm 72 years old 
And in many ways, I feel like I'm seeing myself for the first time. And what I see, I like. What I feel, I like. And I feel like, in many ways, my life's just kind of, it's gotten a jump start, or it's just beginning. That's, that's a very sweet message, Jenny. And, <laughs> Thank you. you know, we are, I think we are honored and privileged to be a, a small part of that journey for you. Small part? I would say you were a rather large part. <laughs> but there's one other thing that happened, which I have to mention. I, I had a, a, an unexpected consequence of a photo shoot that I was doing in Cape Town, South Africa. I, my husband and I live there. Uh, as much as we can. And I, I also am a writer and I was redoing my blog and the photograph from when I began the blog looked totally different than the way I look now. So I had to update it. So I hired a professional photographer, makeup artist. We did the whole thing, it was very fun. And during that process, the makeup artist also happened to be a model. And she was taking photographs of me on her iPhone while the professional photographer was doing her thing. Bia, the makeup artist, sent the photos to her agent. Her agent got back to her immediately and said, I have to meet her, I have to meet her. Long story, much shorter, I have signed a two-year modeling contract with MMM Agency in Cape Town, South Africa. I now have a three-year South African work visa. And as soon as this COVID thing is over, I'm, I'm returning to South Africa. So one just never knows where life is going to go and the twists and turns that it can possibly take. And I never in my life would have imagined that this would happen. And the ironic part of all of this is I am six feet tall, but the irony is I have no clue how to walk in high heels. I've never worn them. I don't know what <laughs> I'm gonna do. I'm praying they don't put me in high heels. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Um, all right, so uh, we'll, we, we'll, I don't want, we don't wanna take uh, more of your time and uh, we'll wrap it up. But I think um, hopefully for people that are watching, first you can get a sense as to how infectious Jenny's energy is as a person, regardless of the surgery that we performed, and that um, is all her. And I think everyone in this office has gotten a little flavor of that, and it has. She's a real battery charger. Um, oh, thank you. A positive impact on us, and that's why you know we thought about this crazy time when we're all home and ways to kind of help with patient education, and immediately thought that this would be an awesome opportunity to kind of share you with whoever is uh, listening. So we want to thank you so much. It really has been a privilege to be a part of your journey. Um, and we have gotten a ton out of taking care of you as well. Uh, uh, well, thank you. Believe me, the feeling is mutual. Okay. All right. All right. For our audience, thank you for tuning in and listening. I know it was a, I know it was a, a little on the longer side, but we wanted to provide as much education as we could. Um, sometimes plastic surgery is a, 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 a black box and, you know, people want to kind of dive in and figure out what it's all about. And there's no better way than hearing our perspective and then seeing a real life patient go through the whole thing. So thank you for joining us and uh, stay safe and healthy, everybody. Take care. All right.